Mini is back, and so am I. There's no good without bad. <laughs> and apropos good and bad, today we're going to discuss malignant covert narcissists. You've never heard this one before. But it stands to reason that if there is a malignant version of the overt, grandiose narcissist, there should be a malignant version of the covert, fragile, vulnerable, shy narcissist. And indeed, there is. My name is Sam Vaknin. I'm the author of Malignant Self-Love, Narcissism Revisited, a former visiting professor of psychology and a not-so-shy member of the faculty of SIAPS. It is commonly accepted that there is a variant of overt grandiose narcissism known as malignant narcissism. <clears throat> it's the unsavory combination of sadism, psychopathy, and narcissism. <laughs> the perfect trifecta, your dream partner. Indeed, some scholars suggest that what we call overt grandiose narcissism is actually a form of psychopathy and that the only real narcissism is covert, compensatory. There's an innate, bad object, an inferiority complex, feelings of inadequacy, of unworthiness, of being unlovable. And the compensation is to appear to be godlike, to insist on one's perfection and brilliance, omniscience and omnipotence. So this is where the field is heading, focusing on the compensatory aspects of narcissism. And apparently, covert narcissism is irreconcilable, cannot be put together with malignant narcissism. Because malignant narcissism is in your face, it's defiant, it's reckless, it's contumacious, authority rejecting. It's, in short, grandiose, it's aggressive, even violent, it's sadistic. These are not typical traits of a covert narcissist. How can we put the two together? This I will attempt to do in today's video, because I firmly believe from my experience that there is such a thing as covert malignant Narcissist. Now, malignant narcissism in the covert version is also compensatory. In other words, we have two layers of compensation. The original covert narcissism compensates for inferiority and the bad object. And then there is a second layer of compensation, which is the malignancy, malignant narcissism. Why do we need, or why does the covert narcissist need two layers of compensation? Because of the collapse. Covert narcissists are in a permanent state of collapse. They are frustrated. They are inefficacious. They are losers. They never succeed to attract narcissistic supply, to um, accomplish things, to become famous, to draw attention to themselves, and so on and so forth. This permanent state of collapse resonates with a bad object and reinforces it. It's as if constant failure, repeated defeats, they affirm and confirm and buttress and uphold the covert narcissist's innate or inner self-perception as a loser, as a nobody, as a no good, is an unworthy and lovable person. So the covert narcissist uh, has a problem. Unlike the overt or grandiose narcissist, increasingly it becomes more difficult to lie to himself or to herself about the state of things, about his or her life. As the covert narcissist keeps stumbling from one failure to another, from one defeat to another, from, from one frustrated stratagem to another, 
from one harebrained scheme to another, from one failed attempt to attract attention to another, as these reminders of collapse accumulate, the covert narcissist constellation of self-defeating, self-destructive, self-rejecting and self-loathing inner voices, they become louder and they become much more convincing. And the covert narcissist needs to compensate for this by adopting a posture of malignancy, by becoming a malignant narcissist. So whereas in the overt, grandiose version of narcissism, the malignancy, malignant narcissism, has to do with an emphasis or an exaggeration of antisocial traits and sadism. In the covert narcissist, the malignant compensation has to do with a desperate attempt to somehow silence, repress the bad object inside the covert narcissist. It's when the initial primary compensation fails, malignant compensation is a secondary compensation. So in the overt grandiose narcissist, we have um, narcissism. And when this narcissism is extrapolated, when this narcissism is emphasized and exaggerated, and writ large, it becomes malignant. In the covert narcissist, there's an initial posture, initial posture of inferiority, of failure, of defeat, of self-deprecation, of frustration, of self-directed aggression. That's the initial posture. Then there is a compensatory layer, which is the covert narcissism, the belief, although this belief is rarely communicated or verbalized, but the belief in one's own superiority, one's own uh, brilliance, one's own perfection. So this is the first layer of compensation. But when confronted with the vicissitudes and exigencies of life, with constant failure and defeat, the covert narcissist can no longer maintain this self-deception this facade, and he resorts to malignant compensation, the second layer of compensation, second level of compensation. Um, and through the malignant compensation, he tries, the covert narcissist tries to somehow restore himself or herself, the gender pronouns are interchangeable, to restore themselves into a state of functioning. Malignant narcissism, therefore, is compensatory in covert narcissism, and it's a last resort. I'd like to read to you something from the amazing poem, The Rhyme of the Ancient Mariner. Like one that on a lonesome road doth walk in fear and dread, and having once turned around, walks on and turns no more his head because he knows a frightful fiend doth close behind him tread. This is a perfect encapsulation of the covert narcissist's dread of his or her own shame, the truth of his or her own inferiority and inadequacy and incompetence and com incompatibility with the world, inability to exact and extricate positive outcomes from the environment, a lack of self-efficacy. The narcissist, the covert narcissist, knows a frightful fiend doth close behind him tread. And so he never turns, turns around. He never turns around because of the terror of coming face to face with himself, because the fiend is the, narcissist, the covert narcissist himself or herself. So this is the this is the background to understand how malignant narcissism compensates for problems and issues in covert narcissism, 
I need to introduce it to the concept of externalization. <clears throat> now, externalization is a defense mechanism where one's thoughts and feelings and perceptions are attributed to the external world, not internally. They're perceived as if they're coming from the outside, independent of oneself, independent of one's experiences. And projection is a private case of externalization, is when we attribute to other people elements of ourselves, traits of ourselves that we're ashamed of, that we reject in ourselves, that we would not like to have. So if we are weak, we would say that, yo, someone else is weak. This is projection. And it's, a, a, again, a case, a private case of externalization. Externalization is the process of learning to distinguish between self and the environment. And it usually occurs during childhood. Again, a private case of externalization is othering, realizing that other people exist, that they are external to yourself, and that they are separate from you have their own life, preferences, priorities, emotions, cognitions, wishes, dreams. This is a form of externalization, othering. Uh, I dedicate several videos um, on this channel to othering. But there is another manifestation of externalization which is more relevant to our video today. It is the process by which a drive, some drive, is aroused by external stimuli, not by internal stimuli. So while a normal person would feel hunger and seek food, someone with an externalization problem would come across food and this would arouse in him or her hunger. So internal states are triggered by external stimuli in externalization. Similarly, the psychopath, for example, is bound to become aggressive when confronted with other people. So this aggression is a form of externalization. It's not that the psychopath was angry and then he met people. He meets people and this makes him angry. Externalization is a crucial dynamic and process in narcissism. Mrs. Narcissists uh, are incapable of perceiving the externality of objects. They're incapable of grasping that, for example, other people are out there, separate from them. What narcissists do, they internalize everything. So narcissists have the opposite externalization problem. Rather than react to external stimuli and then develop an internal state, an inner process, the narcissist develops an inner process, an internal state of mind, based on the conversion of external objects into internal objects. That's in a nutshell. Now, what I'm going to do, I'm going to read to you the traits and behaviors of covert narcissists. I'm going to use Cooper, the late Cooper and Akhtar's table dated 1989, the cornerstone of covert narcissism studies. I'm going to read from this table and then I'm going to demonstrate to you how the covert narcissist develops malignant narcissism as a compensation for the problems and issues and conundrums that are presented by Cooper and Akhtar's table. Start with self-concept. Cooper and Akhtar say that the covert narcissist is in a state of inferiority, morose self-doubts, marked propensity toward feeling ashamed, fragility, relentless search for glory and power, marked sensitivity to criticism, hypervigilance, and realistic setbacks. So this is the background. This is the psychological background of the covert narcissist. This is the land the covert narcissist inhabits. That's his constant state of mind. And it's 
intolerable, is unbearable, is difficult to live with. And so the covert narcissist compensates for this by developing mal a malignancy. He becomes a malignant narcissist. It's a form of malignant compensation, but unique to the covert narcissist. Whereas the malignant compensation in overt grandiose narcissists is to be more overt and more grandiose and more antisocial and more psychopathic and more of everything. In the covert narcissist, the malignancy is more nuanced. So the covert narcissist problem with self-concept is solved via several mechanisms. Number one, grandiosity but this is a type of grandiosity i would call it latent grandiosity it's an inner conviction that the covert narcissist has that he is superior that he is brilliant that he is perfect that he is godlike but he never verbalizes it he never communicates it it's not ostentatious as is the case with Narcissists, classic narcissists, and psychopaths. The covert narcissist grandiosity is an in, inner dialogue, an internal dialogue between the covert narcissist and himself. And yet it forms a part of the malignant compensation in the covert narcissist because the covert narcissist uses this inner conviction of his inflated fantastic self-image he uses it to offset to somehow defray or somehow ameliorate and mitigate uh, the sense of inferiority the self-doubts the shame the fragility the vulnerability and this grandiosity drives the covert narcissist to what Akhtar and Cooper called a relentless search for glory and power. Covert narcissist, under the radar, under the cover, is very driven, very ambitious. I would say insidiously and virulently so. His ambition is toxic, all-consuming, obsessive, compulsive, virtually insane. This is the only way he can survive somehow against the waves of shame that sweep over him time and again. Whereas the grandiose overt narcissist is able to isolate himself from the shame. There's a barrier, there's a firewall between the grandiose narcissist and the reservoir of life-threatening shame at the core of the narcissist. The covert narcissist has failed in doing this. It's another form of collapse. The covert narcissist is in constant contact with this ominous, menacing shame. It threatens to overwhelm him, overpower him, and drown him. In short, this shame threatens to dysregulate the covert narcissist, reduce the covert narcissist into a state akin or reminiscent of borderline personality. So to fight this off, the covert narcissist inhabits a paracosm, a fantasy, an internal, not shared, but internal fantasy, idiosyncratic, unique, individual fantasy, where he is godlike. He is the god of that fantasy. He is the godhead of that fantasy. This grandiosity is a bulwark, a defense against the shame, the self-doubt, the sense of inferiority, and so on and so forth. Another element in the malignant compensation for the self-concept problem is psychopathy. The covert narcissist, when exposed to stress, anxiety, environmental challenges, utter collapse, mortification, the covert narcissist becomes a primary psychopath. I have a video dedicated to this. I encourage you to look for it in the comorbidities playlist. On this channel. He becomes a primary psychopath. The same way a borderline, someone with borderline personality disorder, becomes a secondary psychopath when exposed to abandonment, rejection, 
and humiliation, the covert narcissist becomes a primary psychopath when exposed to the same ambient or uh, um, environmental cues and circumstances. So the primary psychopath is callous, exploitative, manipulative, Machiavellian, and, and the covert narcissist suddenly transforms, adopts as another self-state and transitions from a doormat to a bully um, in an instant. And then he becomes psychopathic. There's a sense of immunity to the consequences of his actions, recklessness, a lot of projection of the parts that the covert narcissist is ashamed of or cannot tolerate. He attributes them to other people. And overwhelming sadism. The sadism in malignant covert narcissists is much more pronounced, much more pervasive, much more dangerous, much more cruel than the sadism in malignant overt narcissism. The overt narcissist the malignant overt narcissist is much less sadistic than the malignant covert narcissist. And the reason is that the covert narcissist is sadistic to start with. The covert narcissist is constantly frustrated and this frustration is converted and transformed and transmutes into aggression. So the covert narcissist constantly accumulates aggression. And this aggression is coupled with envy, with hatred, what we call negative effects. And when you put all this together, this seething cauldron, this, when you put it together, it's a witch's brew. And when the covert narcissist transitions to a psychopathic, malignant self-state, he his sadism shines through. It's as if this new self-state legitimizes the sadism. And the covert narcissist is going to design ingenious ways to torment you and torture you and undermine you and humiliate you, especially in public, and somehow inflict on you enormous pain, which he is going to enjoy tremendously as an affirmation of his omnipotence and godlike qualities. So this is the malignant compensation for self-concept issues in uh, covert narcissism. Next on the Cooper and Akhtar table of covert narcissism, 1989, is interpersonal relationships. They say the covert narcissist is unable to genuinely depend on others and trust them. There's chronic envy of others' talents, possessions, and capacity for deep object relations. There's a lack of regard for generational boundaries. There's a disregard for other people's time and a refusal to be responsive and react reactive. They give examples that the covert narcissist refuses to answer letters. So the covert narcissist's interpersonal relationships are the reification and manifestation and embodiment of the covert narcissist um, steaming, seething, uh, vo uh, volcanic uh, inner space where he is constantly in, in pain, constantly hurt by life's slings and arrows, by uh, his negativistic attitude, by the belief that he is constantly discriminated against, overlooked, um, unappreciated, demoted, hated, criticized. He is, the covert narcissist spends an inordinate amount of time hunting for slights and insults and imagining in his sick mind uh, payback and retribution. He cannot therefore depend on other people and trust them because he attributes to them his state of mind. He projects. Because he is vengeful, he thinks people are vengeful. Because he is hateful, he thinks people are hateful. 
because he is resentful. He thinks people are resentful because he envies everyone. He thinks everyone envies him or her. Okay? All gender pronouns are interchangeable. So he is unable to incorporate himself into any social unit or structure, to engage in any form of social intercourse or discourse. He constantly envies others, everything they have and everything they are. And he is, as I said, he is a bit psychopath, antisocial, not psychopath, antisocial. He's abrasive, he's rude, he's humiliating, or he's sulking, gives you the silent treatment. He's uh, uh, frustrating on purpose, sabotaging. And, and in short, the covert narcissist is passive aggressive, passive aggression or negativism. Negative, negativistic personality. So. And passive aggression is an element of malignant compensation together with fantasy, introjection, and sadism. When the covert narcissist encounters and experiences inter difficulties in interpersonal relationships, which make it ex almost impossible for him to obtain secure, regular narcissistic supply, from the environment. So this leads inexorably and invariably to a state of collapse. To compensate for this, the covert narcissist creates a fantastic internal space, a paracosm, we mentioned it before, and inhabits this space and only this space. Covert narcissists are, are nearly psychotic. They are more psychotic than overt narcissists. They are more withdrawn. They are their reality testing is much more impaired. They introject much more. They convert the external objects, ex other people, separate people, external people. They convert them into internal objects. And they are sadistic and passive aggressive within this uh, fantastic space and in reality, actually. And this is the malignant version of covert narcissism. The next part of the table has to do, deals with social adaptation. Uh, Cooper and Akhtar describe the covert in these terms, nagging aimlessness, shallow vocational commitment, dilettante-like attitudes, multiple but superficial interests, chronic boredom, aesthetic tastes often ill-informed and imitative. And of course, this is an excellent encapsulation of the psychopath. Psychopaths are exactly like this. This characterizes psychopath 100%. So here the malignant compensation sits well, coheres with who the covert narcissist anyhow is, with who the covert narcissist is at all times. In short, what I'm trying to say is that covert narcissism includes a pronounced element or pronounced elements of psychopathy. Covert narcissists are much closer to primary psychopathy uh, in, in this respect, when it comes to social functioning and social adaptation and interpersonal relationships and so on and so forth. So there is an interesting mirror image here. The covert narcissist is, is much more narcissistic than the overt narcissist when it comes to internal processes, the inner landscape, the psychology, then the covert narcissist is more narcissistic than the overt narcissist. But when it comes to the environment, circumstances, other people, interpersonal relationships, social functioning, and so on and so forth, the covert actually is usually more psychopathic than the overt. For example, the overt or grandiose narcissist is more likely to collaborate with other people, to work in teams to obtain a goal. Yes, there will be a lot of friction, a lot of infighting, a lot of ego trips and power plays and mind games, all true. But at least the covert grandiose narcissist is capable in principle of mobilizing multiple people and creating ad hoc coalitions and alliances to obtain goals. The covert narcissist is utterly incapable of this. 
That's why covert narcissists are loners. Majority of them are loners. Now, even when the covert narcissist pretends to be someone he is not, a, a wolf in sheep's clothing, when the covert narcissist pretends to be, I don't know, a victim of narcissistic abuse, or when he pretends to be a, a empathic, or when he pretends to be kind and nice and compassionate and helpful, and even when the covert narcissist plays a, um, play acts, adopts a role that is divorced from reality, the reality of who he is, even then, it devolves very fast into a loner position. Even when the covert narcissist becomes a cult leader, there's only one cult leader. The members of the cult are interjects, they're extensions. They don't really exist. Even when the covert narcissist becomes a politician, he aspires to work alone and to be sui generis, to be a unique case. Covert narcissists are really bad at working with other people because it triggers their insecurities, their, their self-doubts, their sense of inferiority. They become envious, then they destroy everything. They're very self-defeating and self-destructive. And of course, the malignant compensation for this is grandiosity. So ironically, covert narcissists, although their grandiosity is non-expressed, is not manifested, is unobservable, is not ostentatious, is hidden, is latent, and covert narcissists are very good at deceiving people by pretending to be humble. This is known as pseudo-humility in clinical terms. They play humble. Um, but actually, the grandiosity of covert narcissists far exceeds the grandiosity of the overt grandiose narcissist. And that's the irony. The covert narcissist needs to triple, quadruple and quintuple his grandiosity just in order to compensate for the gaping hole that is left in him by constant collapse and failure and defeat and the admonitions and injunctions of the bad object. So, while the overt grandiose narcissist grandiosity is a cognitive distortion, the covert narcissist grandiosity is actually a malignant compensation. And in this sense, the covert narcissist grandiosity is identical to the grandiosity of the psychopath, because psychopaths also have grandiosity. Grandiosity is not unique to narcissism, by the way. It's a common mistake online where people confuse grandiosity with narcissism. So I've heard self-styled experts say that all psychopaths are narcissists, which is complete, unmitigated, utter, ignorant, shockingly ignorant nonsense. All psycho most psychopaths are grandiose. All narcissists are grandiose, but grandiosity is a common denominator. It doesn't mean that they are one and the same. Same goes for covert narcissism. But in covert narcissism, the grandiosity is so outlandish, so all-consuming, so fantastic, so aggressive, so demanding, so shocking, so, um, I would say, surrealistic, that the covert narcissist's grandiosity is very reminiscent of the psychopath's grandiosity. The next part of the table, Cooper and Akhtar's table of covert narcissism, the next part is ethics, standards, and ideals. They say that the covert narcissist possesses a readiness to shift values in order to gain favor, pathological lying, materialistic lifestyle, delinquent tendencies, inordinate ethnic and moral relativism, irreverence toward authority. And again, coming to the same conclusion, this is a perfect description of the psychopath. This is exactly what the psychopath is. So it would seem that they were, Cooper and Akhtar are describing the malignant compensation of the covert narcissist. This is how the covert narcissist compensates for his innate insecurity, uncertainty, doubt, fears, uh, anxiety, um, sense of being less than good, less than sufficient, inadequate, failure, and so on and so forth. He compensates for this. 
by actually becoming a primary psychopath. So whereas the malignant transformation of the ordinary narcissist, the classic, the, covert, the overt, the grandiose narcissist, the malignant transformation has, has to do with a combination of sadism and psychopathy, but with pronounced narcissistic aspects and traits. In the covert narcissist, the malignant transformation or the malignant compensation is psychopathy coupled with sadism. It's as if the narcissism is suspended because it keeps failing as a compensatory mechanism. It's as if the covert says, look here, I've tried to be a narcissist, but I'm not doing this well. I keep failing. I keep collapsing. I don't want to be a narcissist anymore. I want to be a psychopath. I want to be a sadist. So the covert narcissist, when his narcissism fails, when he collapses, transitions to a self-state self which is essentially sadistic and psychopathic in pure terms, without narcissism, or where the narcissism is not a main component, not a major component. Let me summarize this for you, because it's a very important clinical distinction. The ordinary, classical, run-of-the-mill, overt, grandiose narcissists, develop, some of them, develop malignancy and then they become narcissists who are also psychopaths and sadists. The narcissism is very, very dominant. The psychopathy is at the service of narcissism. The sadism is a way to extract sadistic supply, which is a form of narcissistic supply. It's all about narcissism. The overt, grandiose narcissist does not cease to be a narcissist when he becomes malignant. On the very contrary, his malignancy emphasizes his narcissism. This is the overt, the, the overt. The covert narcissist is exactly the opposite. The covert narcissist discards his narcissism because his narcissism has failed, led him to constant pain and collapse and self-recrimination and humiliation. He doesn't want to be a narcissist anymore. It's not working. Instead, he is transitioning to a self-state of psychopathy, pure psychopathy and sadism, pure sadism. So the covert narcissist spends a lot of time as a narcissist and some time as a pure primary psychopath who is also a sadist. And this is the dichotomy of the covert narcissist. This is what we don't see in overt narcissism. The overt narcissist is always a narcissist. The overt narcissist is a narcissist when he's a psychopath. The overt narcissist is a narcissist when he's a sadist. But the covert narcissist is not a narcissist when he's a psychopath. He's not a narcissist, not primarily when he's a sadist. And this is a very important distinction. What about love and sexuality? According to Akhtar and Cooper, the covert narcissist has an inability to remain in love, an impaired capacity for viewing the romantic partner as a separate individual with his or her own interests, rights, and values, an inability to genuinely comprehend the incest taboo and occasional sexual perversions. The malignant compensation here is psychopathy, sadism, but above all, autoerotism. The covert narcissist, and this is common also to the overt, but common but less pronounced, and the frequency is reduced in overt narcissism. As an overt narcissism, there's a process called sublimation. The sex drive is converted into socially acceptable behaviors and goals and accomplishments. The covert narcissist is unable to accomplish anything, unable to realize anything. It's a true loser and failure. And so the covert narcissist, when the covert narcissist tries to convert his emotions, erotic emotions, romantic emotions, um, sexual drive, when he tries to convert them, he doesn't convert them into socially acceptable goals because he's unable to accomplish goals. The covert narcissist converts them 
into autoerotism. Autoerotism means the covert narcissist regards himself or herself as the sexual object. The covert narcissist is attracted sexually to himself. The covert narcissist arouses himself by looking at his body, touching his body, and so on and so forth. But he does this by sadistically humiliating and degrading willing consenting partners, for example, submissive partners. So the sadism here is at the service of autoerotism. It's a sexual sadism. And this is coupled with psychopathy in the sense that the covert narcissist would not hesitate to prey on vulnerable people in order to convert them or to use them as submissive, albeit willing and consenting fully partners, so as to uphold his autoerotism. Again, the solutions are very different here. When the overt narcissist becomes malignant, his sexuality is other directed. It may be a sexuality that we would find abhorrent or unacceptable, for example, extreme types of king or, or sadomaso or whatever, but it would still be other directed. It would be autoerotic, but it would be um, collaborative, shall we say. While the covert narcissist, unable to convert sex, love into socially acceptable modes, what he would do, he would prey, he would become a predator and prey on vulnerable potential partners, convert them to the cause of degradation and humiliation and submissiveness, thereby satisfying or slaking his sating his own sad sadism, and this would arouse him sexually in his attraction to himself. So the covert narcissist would be attracted, would arouse himself by perceiving himself as irresistible through other people, through his partner's gaze, through his degraded and humiliated partner's gaze, the covert narcissist convinces himself that he is irresistible, finds himself irresistible, and makes love to himself, auto-erotically. The humiliation and the degradation of the partner has to be not only consensual, but enthusiastic as far as the partner is concerned, because of the element of irresistibility. Covert narcissist needs to feel that he is amazing, unique, top performer, irresistible, drop dead gorgeous, you name it. And this can be, he can obtain this kind of sensation or feeling only if the partner indeed finds him uh, this way, or at least communicates this way. And finally, cognitive style. Akhtar and Cooper say that the covert narcissist knowledge is limited to trivia, headline intelligence. The covert narcissist is forgetful of details, especially names, impaired in the capacity for learning new skills, has a tendency to change meanings of, meanings of reality when facing a threat to self-esteem. Language and speaking are used for regulating self-esteem. The malignant compensation in this case is grandiosity. Grandiosity, and but it is grandiosity that is coupled with kind of intellectual laziness, if you wish, entitlement. The covert narcissist, because his grandiosity is much bigger than the overt narcissist, albeit no, never expressed, his entitlement is much bigger. The covert narcissist appears to be lazy or indolent, appears to be laid back, but actually it's because the covert narcissist believes that he is entitled to everything, and everyone's attention and, and property and reputation and accomplishments and so on without any commensurate effort, without any investment, without any study, without any work. This is the malignant compensation for the problems with cognitive style that the covert narcissist possesses. 
In short, covert narcissism is a much more complex condition than overt narcissism because covert narcissism is a state of collapse. It's when overt narcissism failed, it failed. And in this sense, covert narcissists are comparable psychodynamically to borderline, people with borderline. This borderline is also a failure of overt narcissism. The covert borderline compensates for this failure and the feelings of shame that this failure induces. It compensates for this, for this, by becoming a primary psychopath. And this gives rise to malignant covert narcissism. It's a primary psychopath who is also sadistic to a large extent and operates through a variety of defense mechanisms, cognitive distortions and behavioral uh, strategies that I've described in this video. It is time to explore the malignant version, the malignant variant of covert narcissism. So I suspect that it's much more common among covert narcissists than among overt narcissists. We believe that 3% of overt narcissists are also malignant. I would not be shocked to find that something like 15 to 20% of covert narcissists are actually malignant. And the malignancy of covert narcissism is far, far more ac accentuated and a lot more dangerous to society than the malignancy of the overt narcissist. While the overt narcissist malignancy is socially disruptive, hurts people, undermines uh, situations and projects and so on and so forth, the covert narcissist malignancy is covert and therefore its reach and its infiltration and its invasiveness is comparable to cancer. It's, it's much bigger. It's aggressively, it aggressively multiplies and, in, and aggressively infiltrates and invades healthy tissue, healthy social tissue. So even if we were to accept that overt narcissists are actually primary psychopaths and that the malignant version of overt narcissism is just the addition of sadism, we would still have to somehow tackle the fact, the indisputable fact, that covert narcissists act psychopathically very, very often. And when they do, they're literally indistinguishable from psychopaths, primary psychopaths. This is a major problem because you can't see them coming. They're great at camouflage and disguise, as I mentioned, pseudo-humility. And so it's a topic that bears a focus on. I think it should be the next hot button topic in narcissism, in the study of narcissism. Thank you for listening. Malignant narcissism is the nefarious confluence and comorbidity of classic narcissistic personality disorder coupled with psychopathic behaviors and traits, a little more than antisocial, psychopathic, and above all, sadism. Now I've dealt with malignant narcissism in other videos, and I even proposed a new diagnosis, malignant covert narcissist the malignant version of covert narcissist, because the, the classic description of the malignant narcissist has to do with overt or grandiose narcissism. <clears throat> there is actually very little on a covert narcissist who is also malignant, although Otto Kernberg had alluded to this in several of his articles and books when he described what he called the passive malignant narcissist. At any rate, I recommend that you watch my video Malignant Covert Narcissist Becomes Primary Psychopath to Compensate for Collapse. Whew, quite a mouthful. <laughs> and once you have watched this video, come back here. Because today I'm going to read to you an excerpt from an article by Otto Kernberg, which describes what I consider to be a little explored comorbidity between borderline personality organization and malignant narcissism.
So now we have three situations, three diagnoses, or three diagnostic clusters. We have classic malignant narcissist, who is actually an overt grandiose narcissist, plus psychopathy, plus sadism. We have covert, malignant covert narcissist, who is actually a covert, fragile, vulnerable narcissist, plus psychopathy, plus sadism. That's cluster number two. In cluster number three, the borderline malignant narcissist, which is, who is actually an overt, grandiose narcissist, plus psychopathy, plus sadism, plus borderline personality organization. And no, it's not something I came up with. It's something the inimitable and one and only Otto F. Kernberg came up with in 2020 in an article titled Malignant Narcissism and Large Group Regression, published in the Psychoanalytic Quarterly in January uh, 2020, as I said. Let me just read the excerpt to you, because one cannot improve on Kernberg any more than one can improve on Shakespeare. He is the Shakespeare of Cluster B personality disorder. So here's what he wrote. I have defined the syndrome of malignant narcissism in earlier studies of severe forms of pathological narcissism. He refers to his work from dated 1984 and 2018, although he fails to give credit to the guy who actually was the first to describe malignant narcissism in 1964, I think, Eric Fromm in The Heart of Men, in his book, The Heart of Men, describes malignant narcissism and coins the phrase malignant narcissism. Kernberg neglects to mention it. Not good. <laughs> no, no. Okay. So back to Kernberg's article. He says, I've defined the syndrome, etc., etc., as characterized by the presence of one, a narcissistic personality disorder with all its characteristic features, a pathological grandiose self, inordinate self-centeredness, and a sense of superiority, strong manifestations of envy, devaluation of others, severe limitations of the capacity of emotional investment in others, and a chronic sales sense of emptiness that requires an ongoing search for external stimulation or the excitement derived, for example, from drugs or sexual behavior. So this is component number one in malignant narcissism as described by Kernberg. Ingredient number two, significant paranoid personality features. Number three, strong egosyntonic aggression directed against others or self. Number four, significant antisocial behavior. Kernberg continues to say, the basic psychopathological features of the syndrome of malignant narcissism are a dominance of unconscious conflicts around intense aggressive affect from whatever origin, together with the development of the compensating pathology of a grandiose self. Aggressive motivation infiltrates the grandiose sense of self, leading to egosyntonic aggressivity on the one hand and to the projection of aggression in the form of paranoid tendencies on the other. The severe deficit in the development of an internalized system of ethical values derived from the underlying basic, basic failure in normal identity formation that affects the build-up of such an ethical structure, superego development. This severe deficit determines the development of antisocial behaviors. Patients with the syndrome of malignant narcissism function along a wide spectrum of social dysfunction. The most ill patients with these characteristics suffer from a total breakdown of their capacity for social interactions, incapacity to function in work and profession, and breakdown in intimate relations, together with the development of severe affective dysregulation and such a degree of disturbed interpersonal behavior that makes for initial confusion with borderline personality disorder. At the other extreme, are patients who are able to maintain their social functions and work conditions and only show breakdown in their personal intimate relationships and incapacity 
to significantly invest in non-exploitive behavior with others and an extremely exaggerated concept of self and commitment to self-interest that are pursued in an aggressive way without moral restrictions. So Kernberg points to the fact that there is a subtype of malignant narcissism, which is essentially indistinguishable from borderline personality disorder, or at the very minimum, is a borderline personality organization. In passing, Kernberg comes up with a totally new diagnosis. Diagnosis. So we have, like, to summarize, three types of malignant narcissists. The overt grandiose malignant narcissist, the covert, the malignant covert narcissist, and the borderline malignant narcissist. The first one, the overt grandiose malignant narcissist, is simply a narcissist, who, a classic narcissist, who is also a psychopath and a sadist. The malignant covert narcissist is a covert narcissist who is a psychopath and a sadist. And the borderline malignant narcissist is a malignant narcissist whose dysfunction and emotional regulation render him almost indistinguishable from borderline patients, from a borderline personality organization or even disorder or condition. These are the three types of malignant narcissism. Thank you, Professor Kernberg, Dr. Kernberg, and thank you, the viewers, for having endured with me thus far. There is no comorbidity more creepy and ill-understood than the schizoid malignant narcissist. To remind you, a malignant narcissist is someone who could be diagnosed simultaneously as a narcissist, a psychopath, and a sadist. <laughs> a delectable concoction. And so, some malignant narcissists are also schizoid. Schizoid personality disorder is an affliction which renders interpersonal relationships almost impossible. There's no interest in having interactions with other people, not even in sex. So put the three together, malignant narcissism, which is again narcissism, psychopathy and sadism, coupled with schizoid a schizoid personality, and you have a veritable, a veritable oxymoron, a contradiction in terms, because narcissism by definition involves dependence on other people for narcissistic supply, input and feedback from the outside, which allows for internal regulation, internal regulation of a sense of self-worth and sometimes of emotions and moods similar to borderline personality disorder. So the narcissist is a junkie of attention. The narcissist is addicted to attention, and attention comes only from other people. In other words, the narcissist is dependent on other people. And on the other hand, schizoids find any protracted interaction with other people excruciating. They hate to be in contact, definitely meaningful contact, emotionally infused contact with other people. And so there's a contradiction here. There's a dynamic clash, an internal conflict that is very difficult to resolve. Schizoid malignant narcissists usually obtain narcissistic supply impersonally, for example, virtually, online. They try to avoid interpersonal interactions face to face, in the flesh, so to speak. They try to construct environments where they are self-sufficient. They can, for example, make a living. At the same time, they can garner attention, adulation and admiration from anonymous sources, from people they don't know, they've never met and would never, would never communicate with. And so this is virtual narcissistic supply. And this is a typical setup or setting of the schizoid malignant narcissist's life, 
it's a constricted life in the sense that it does not involve any meaningful exchanges with other human beings and it does involve uh, interactions with symbols on the screen pixels representations of human beings which are very reminiscent of representations of people within the narcissist's mind the internal objects so the schizoid malignant narcissist who interacts with external emanations and manifestations of internal objects in the form of images on the screen or likes or followers or what have you this is a form of in many ways this is a form of self-supply and schizoid malignant narcissists are very adept at regulating their flow of supply by self-supply they rely on self-supply much more than other types of narcissists who rely typically on other people for supply self-supply in schizoid malignant narcissism is not only a stopgap measures measure it's a preference it's a preference it's regulated it's controllable it's safe it's predictable it's as rich as as you can make it it's a fount of nurturance that the schizoid malignant narcissist finds infinitely preferable to having to um, kind of wade through relationships with other people relationships with other people in the schizoid malignant narcissist's mind resembles swamp a swamp which you have to kind of wade through and there's always a risk of being sucked in and, and drowning the schizoid malignant narcissist would rather protect himself or defend himself behind a screen uh, behind behind the glass brightly if you wish and harvest attention in a variety of highly impersonal uh, ways but life such as it is forces one to be in touch with other people even the most dedicated devout hermit in a monastery on in Shangri-La ultimately has to come across the pizza delivery guy <laughs> life intrudes and its agents other human beings are all over the place it's very difficult to avoid contact completely ultimately you need to buy groceries usually you need to pay bills I mean one way or another you're going to end up face to face with this dread another human being when in touch with other people even even out of choice the schizoid malignant narcissist becomes inordinately psychopathic and sadistic he's annoyed he's irritated he is contemptuous and he is hateful and he externalizes aggression there are several reasons to this abrupt transition from a benign docile presence behind the screen to a raving lunatic and and maniac hateful with blazing eyes psychopath and a sadist merciless ruthless callous and revels revels in pain and hurt that he causes others this this very very abrupt abrupt transition has several fountainheads several reasons number one it's partly intended to accomplish goals in the absence of narcissistic supply the schizo the malignant narcissist resorts to sadistic supply and the schizoid malignant narcissist um, actually prefers sadistic supply in face-to-face -face encounters because he's angry at having been coerced having been forced to interact with people in the flesh so every meeting every encounter 
every physical exchange, every, everything is perceived by the schizoid malignant narcissist as an, an imposition. An imposition, coercion, brutal invasion, an intrusion. And there's a lot of resentment, a lot of rage, a lot of anger involved. So the schizoid malignant narcissist is much more likely to become sadistic in his or her encounters with other people, much more likely than the typical malignant narcissist, let alone the run-of-the-mill overt or covert narcissist. The risk of escalating potentially dangerous sadism in schizoid malignant narcissism is much higher, the highest actually, in all the variants, among all the variants of narcissism, because there is this rage of having been forced to be in touch with people. And because sadistic supply feels absolutely so good that it trumps any other form of pleasure. The schizoid malignant narcissist would self-sacrifice, self-defeat and self-destruct just in order to experience the elation and the exaltation of having hurt or damaged another person. And so sadistic supply is pr preferred to narcissistic supply. Narcissistic supply is obtained indirectly, impersonally, as I said, via means of technology. And sadistic supply is face-to-face, -face, in face-to-face -face encounters. And so the sadistic conduct of schizoid malignant narcissists in face-to-face -face encounters is utilitarian, it's goal-oriented. The goal is sadistic supply. The second reason is punishment. This is punitive, punitive sadism. The schizoid malignant narcissist wants to punish people for having, Im for having imposed on his time, for having invaded his personal space, for having consumed his scarce resources. They deserve punishment. They are far inferior to him, and yet they forced him to their level. And so they deserve to be penalized. They deserve to endure some penance. Or... And the sadism or the sadistic eruptions or bursts, outbursts, they are intended to punish the people who force themselves upon the presence of the schizoid malignant narcissist. And finally, sadism pushes people away. Gradually, the schizoid malignant narcissist acquires such a reputation that people shun him, avoid him at all costs. So the sadism serves to restore the schizoid state and to vouchsafe, to guarantee or to firewall the schizoid space. They feed each other. The schizoid malignant narcissist sadism and psychopathy, they're helpful in generating the kind of environment and the kind of conditions that allow the schizoid malignant narcissist to ultimately remain all alone, incommunicado, no contact with anyone, no friends, no family, nothing a total loner, which is the optimal and much desired fantasy of the schizoid malignant narcissist. It's a dream come true. And the sadism and the psychopathy are kind of behavior modification techniques. Communicating to the human environment, stay away, let me be. Sadism creates and maintains the schizoid space. There are many ways. Sadism has many manifestations, many expressions, and many ways. When the schizoid malignant narcissist is in a relationship, and what they define as relationships is nothing you would recognize. <laughs> when they are in contact with another person who is the equivalent of a service provider, the four S's, sex, services, supply, sadistic and narcissistic, and safety. So when they're 
when they cohabit with someone, when they share the same space, mental or physical, with someone who is essentially a service provider, they become highly possessive and jealous. But the possessiveness, possessiveness and jealousy has nothing to do with the fear of loss because the internet service provider is interchangeable and dispensable. You, you are utterly disposable. It's not about um, fear of loss. It's about gotcha, gotcha, like I'm possessive, I'm jealous. It's a kind of entrapment, entrapment, which is intended to sadistically taunt you and torture you and to push, push you to misbehave so that ultimately you justify the foresight and the omniscience of the schizoid malignant narcissist. It's a form of sadism. Uh, there's no real jealousy there because do you, would you care if your internet service provider caters to other clients? Of course you do. You don't. You don't care. It's the same with the schizoid malignant narcissist. He doesn't care if his intimate partner is intimate with others. She's a service provider. Obviously, she could have other clients. That's not a problem. But he is going to impose on her strictures, edicts, rules of conduct, surveil surveillance, um, and he's going he's gonna to create a situation which communicates possessiveness and jealousy, but actually is a form of micromanagement and coercive control. Another form of sadism is called empathy, scanning the partner or other people for vulnerabilities and then leveraging these vulnerabilities, pushing the buttons, hurting where, where it, you know, hitting where it hurts. So vulnerabilities. And then there's setting up for failure, unrealistic expectations, standards that can never be met, reciprocity that is too ideal, no one can can match it. And so these are all intended to set partner or the friend or whoever up for failure. The problem with the malignant with schizoid malignant narcissist is the mixed signals, the dual messaging. On the one hand, the narcissist, the narcissistic part in the schizoid malignant narcissism pushes the individual, pushes the schizoid malignant narcissist to approach people in order to extract supply, in order to enjoy uh, inflicting pain on them, degrading them, in order to be aroused by, by degrading and hurting other people. There's a need for other people. On the other hand, the schizoid part pulls the, the individual away. So there's an approach avoidance repetition compulsion here. There's approach in order to uh, benefit from human company and human touch, buttress grandiosity, share a fantasy, obtain narcissistic supply, etc. And then the schizoid part rebels. Schizoid part pulls the narcissist back. And in order to maintain the schizoid space and to restore the schizoid state, the schizoid malignant narcissist uses sadism to push people away and to establish the periphery, the firewall periphery of his or her existence. This could be extremely confusing and hurtful and potentially even dangerous. And that's why this particular hybrid, this comorbidity, to my mind, is the most complex of them all. And I will dedicate to it a few more videos in the future. Today we are going to discuss the number one narcissist, the king of all narcissists, the alpha narcissist. In short, me. <laughs> Oops, it's the wrong text. Give me a minute. Give me a minute. I'll be right back. Don't go away. Don't go away. There we are. Today we are going to discuss another aspect of malignant narcissism. Just to remind you, 
the malignant narcissist is a delectable combination of narcissism, psychopathy, and sadism. In short, it is someone you would like to marry and have children with. <laughs> and as you may recall, um, those of you who have been around long enough, I've discussed various aspects and dimensions of malignant narcissism in previous videos, some of them very recent. I mentioned, for example, that there are three types of malignant narcissists, the grandiose malignant narcissist, the covert malignant narcissist, and the borderline malignant narcissist. Now, these parallel another classification. Um, Otto Kernberg and, and others have discussed high-functioning malignant narcissists and low-functioning or passive malignant narcissists. And here is the map. What corresponds to what? The grandiose malignant narcissist is a high-functioning narcissist. The covert malignant narcissist is a pro-social, communal malignant narcissist, which is the topic of today's video. And the low-functioning malignant narcissist is also known as the borderline malignant narcissist. Well, now, what's the difference between all these types, subtypes, subspecies, variants? <laughs> it begins to resemble the COVID-19 virus. So what are the differences? Well, a low-functioning malignant narcissist, aka borderline malignant narcissist, is utterly dysfunctional. This kind of person is unable to be efficacious, unable to act and to guarantee outcomes in any field of his life. He is unable to generate any results professionally, he is unable to work regularly in the workplace, he is unable to maintain interpersonal relationships, especially intimate and romantic relationships. So this is a low-functioning narcissist, a bloody mess, <laughs> total chaos in all arenas of life, someone who goes through life living in his wake, disappointed, broken, damaged people, institutions, frustrated hopes, and tamped down expectations. The high-functioning malignant narcissist is professionally functional. He is very successful at the workplace, but he is interpersonally dysfunctional. He cannot maintain relationships in the long term. He fears intimacy. He is unable to engage in secure attachment. In other words, he has an insecure attachment style, and he keeps ruining one relationship after another, something that uh, the beloved Sigmund Freud called a repetition compulsion. So these are the first two types. The low-functioning, borderline malignant narcissist, good for nothing. The high-functioning malignant narcissist, great at his job, sucks at his relationships. But there's a third type, the covert malignant narcissist, also known as the prosocial or communal malignant narcissist. Now, in low-functioning malignant narcissism, human contact of any kind, from shopping to dating, triggers the sadistic element in malignant narcissism. I'm going to repeat this because this is very crucial for uh, the continuation of this video. With the low-functioning borderline narcissist, sadism is triggered each and every time this kind of person comes in contact with another human being. The presence of human being, their speech, their actions, somehow exude an emanation which hasn't been captured in any, any laboratory, but this emanation, whatever it may be, triggers the low-functioning narcissist. He becomes emotionally dysregulated. In other words, he becomes borderline, and he becomes exceedingly sadistic. And so this, the low-functioning narcissist, malignant narcissist sadism is triggered by exposure to human beings. And the low-functioning malignant narcissist justifies his sadism by holding all people in grandiose contempt and haughtiness. He regards all people as inferior, stupid, deserving of their fate. They had it coming. They should have protected themselves better. They're idiots. And so, no big loss. Sadism 
of the low-functioning malignant narcissist is embedded in an ideology of contempt. Over time, the cumulative adverse outcomes of such behavior or misbehavior are such that the malignant narcissist gradually drifts towards withdrawal and avoidance. He adopts schizoid behaviors. In other words, the low-functioning malignant narcissist, the borderline malignant narcissist, becomes sadistic whenever he's in touch with other people, never mind the setting, never mind the framework, never mind the reason for being in touch with other people. So whenever he's in touch with other people, he becomes sadistic. And of course, other people react. There's payback, there's backlash, there's punishment, there's karma. <laughs> And so this kind of low-functioning malignant narcissist at some point begins to avoid other people, to withdraw from social interactions, to isolate himself, to become hermetically sealed in his own bubble of existence. He gradually drifts away. And this is known as schizoid behaviors. Schizoid, beha schizoid behaviors also allow the low-functioning borderline malignant narcissist to preserve ego syntony via alloplastic defenses. Now, that's a very fancy way of saying that when the low-functioning borderline malignant narcissist withdraws from other people, avoids other people, he tells himself that he is, he is doing it because other people are wicked, other people are evil, other people are dumb, other people don't deserve his presence, his contributions his involvement. And so he says to himself, I should not waste my precious time and towering intellect on other people. I should better be alone. Gradually, the low functioning borderline malignant narcissist begins to self supply. In other words, his narcissistic supply emanates from the inside rather than from the outside and this kind of person becomes more and more psychotic as Kernberg had observed in his work on the borderline between psychosis and neurosis low functioning borderline malignant narcissists end up being schizoid behaviorally avoidant and withdrawing but also highly emotionally dysregulated subject to mood disorders and ultimately pseudo-psychotic. They have brief um, psychotic micro-episodes because the stress breaks them apart. They disintegrate or more clinically speaking, they decompensate. So this is the low functioning borderline malignant narcissist. The high functioning malignant narcissist we have discussed in the previous video. There are links in the description. And today I want to dedicate time to the third type, the covert malignant narcissist, also known as the prosocial or communal malignant narcissist. This kind of narcissist, exactly like the high functioning malignant narcissist, this kind of narcissist functions perfectly professionally. But as distinct from the high functioning malignant narcissist, the prosocial and communal mal malignant narcissist also functions well interpersonally. So don't confuse the two. The grandiose, overt, in your face, defined, high functioning, malignant narcissist is a superstar in the workplace, in his chosen career, in his job, able to work, organize and work with teams, and so on and so forth but cannot maintain long-term relationships, intimate relationships, friendship relationships, you name it. He's unable to maintain relationships. He is interpersonally not self-efficacious. Whereas the prosocial and communal na malignant narcissist is good at both fields, at both areas of life. He is good in the workplace, in his job, in his career, his chosen career. And he is also good in maintaining interpersonal relationships. So you would, you would say, if he's so good at everything, why 
do we attribute to such a person any kind of pathology? Because the prosocial communal narcissist, malignant narcissist, makes a distinction between an in-group and an out-group. An in-group are people around the malignant narcissist who provide the malignant narcissist with narcissistic supply and sadistic supply. These are fans, followers, acolytes, intimate partners, friends, people who form together the pathological narcissistic space of the malignant narcissist. These people are known as the in-group. And within the in-group, the pro-social communal covert malignant narcissist is able to maintain functional, long-term relationships in the workplace, in his job, with his team, and in intimate relationships. So he's perfectly functional within the in-group. But the shocking thing and the reason we attribute pathology to this kind of person is that in the out-group, he becomes psychopathic. In the out-group, he becomes sadistic. When this kind of malignant narcissist is forced to interact with people who are not members of the in-group, then he becomes antisocial, violent, aggressive, sadistic, terrifying, monstrous, in short. And this clear demarcation between in-group and out-group is what sets the pro-social communal malignant narcissist apart. He identifies the people who are worthy of having relationships with him, the people who deserve his largesse, his magnanimity, his benefaction, his compassion, his affection, his love, so to speak, what he identifies as love, and his commitment and investment. These kind of people around him, they're the in-group. They never dare to doubt him. They never criticize him. They mirror him the way, the way he wants to see himself. They are unthinking robotic followers and fans and acolytes. And so within the in-group, he's benevolent, he's benign, he's prosocial, he's communal, he's helpful, he's compassionate, he's supportive, he's charitable, and he's altruistic within the in-group. But then when he comes across someone from the out-group, he is likely to attack viciously, to, to destroy, to undermine, to challenge, he becomes combative, he becomes belligerent, he becomes hateful, negative affectivity takes over, hatred, envy, rage, anger, and we see a Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, Dr. Jekyll in the in-group, Mr. Hyde in the out-group. This is what characterizes charismatic leaders political leaders, business leaders, or even family leaders. The formation of the equivalent of a cult. The in-group is a cult. The out-group is the enemy. I want to read to you a, an extended excerpt from the work of Otto Kernberg, recent work published in uh, 2020. It's an article titled Malignant Narcissism and Large Group Regression published in the Psychoanalytic Quarterly, Volume 89. Brilliant, as always. And remember, at all times, what we were talking about. The three types of malignant narcissists, the grandiose, overt, high-functioning narcissist, good at his job, sucks at his relationships. The low-functioning, borderline malignant narcissist can do nothing right, not in relationships, not in his job, not in his career. He sucks in virtually everything. And the covert, the covert malignant narcissist, who outwardly is actually a good guy, a nice guy, passionate, compassionate, prosocial, communal, helpful, charitable, altruistic, etc. But his benevolence, 
his benignity, his charitability, his altruism are limited to the members of the in-group, the members who adulate him, the members who support him, the members who never criticize him, the members who follow him unthinkingly and unhesitatingly, robotically almost. These people enjoy his sunshine. Everyone else is the enemy. We call this dichotomous thinking. Dichotomous thinking is a kind of thinking, black and white, good versus evil, you're with me or you're against me. And it is founded on a primitive defense mechanism, infantile defense mechanism, known as splitting. Okay, enough vaccine, and we go to someone a bit older and much wiser, Otto Kernberg. He has written this in 2020. I want to explicate one concept in his work. It's called the second skin. The second skin is a decisive intervention by leadership in order to protect the well-being, security, and stability of the group's existence. I would have used the word firewall, but then I belong to another generation, evidently. Okay, here we go. Otto Kernberg. He, he's, he discusses now charismatic leaders, most of which are malignant, pro-social, communal, covert, malignant narcissists. He says, the leader's narcissistic self-centeredness and grandiosity, his self-assured signaling what he believes the large group should think and do, and his promise for a brilliant future if he is followed, powerfully reassures the members of a regressed large group against the threat of the loss of individual identity and provides them with a second skin of an idealizing mutual identity of all in identification with the leader. The reduced cognitive level of functioning characteristic of large groups responds positively to simple slogans and cliches that the leader provides them with to confirm their value, uniqueness, importance, and power. Simple slogans replace complex thinking and correspond to the large group's need to feel that they are intimately involved with the thinking of the great leader and understand him completely. And at a deeper unconscious level, don't need to envy him because they are one with him. Everybody is equal in the pursuit of simple ideals and in the proper symbolic expression of such ideas. The well-rationalized aggression against outgroups is fostered by the leader's direct, crude and sadistic expression of animosity against such outgroups, devaluing and dehumanizing them while declaring the large group that he directs to be selected, ideal, morally justified, superior social group. Aggressive outbursts against minorities is fostered, welcome, considered heroic and morally admirable, so that freedom to express destructive behavior excites the group and creates a contaminating festive atmosphere. Bao Lord describes how, during the Chinese Cultural Revolution, the beating up of professors by revolutionary group in the middle of huge public gatherings contaminated the bystanders, so that massive engagement in physical attack and murder became welcome public spectacle. The characteristic antisocial features of the leader with malignant narcissism are reflected in practically public dishonest behavior matched with shameless denial of that behavior. Hitler never acknowledged his clear indirect instructions to eliminate potentially rivalrous leaders of, of his SA troops. He never acknowledged publicly nor in writing his instructions for mass murder of the Jewish population under his control, in spite of being the obvious ultimate source of these orders. Today, by the way, this is known as plausible deniability. Stalin, continues Kernberg, Stalin would invite both privileged followers whom he wished to honor for tea at his place, and also those who already had been secretly condemned to be eliminated. This was sufficiently well known in his intimate circle to cause external anxiety in the invitees, which apparently greatly pleased and amused Stalin. The leader's evident dishonesty 
the self-assured expression of lies that may be easily recognized as such by an outside observer in a broader social environment of general community is perceived by the regressed large group, by the in-group, as a courageous standing up to conventional truth, daring to say the impossible. The leader is showing courage in changing his mind at any point and shifting over, if necessary, to declaring alternative choices of who is the selected enemy at any given moment. The leader's decidedly assuming moral responsibility promotes a sense of freedom from moral constraints, excitement of moving with a powerful wave of political discontent and strife as it is manipulated from the top and cemented by the suggestibility of the large group. Repeated attacks, ridiculing and demeaning humiliation of selected enemies reinforce the group's enjoyment of sadistic behavior. It was the inhumane cruelty of Isis that exerted an exciting attractiveness to many early international followers. This is an excellent description and a comprehensive one of the type of interaction between the covert, pro-social, communal malignant narcissist who becomes a charismatic leader and the in-group with which he interacts. He lets them believe that they are superior, selected, chosen, and therefore they are his natural milieu and he will never hurt them. He will never hurt them because they together as a team are going to attack the enemies and eradicate them and obliterate them. And so this is the psychology of the social, um, pro-social communal narcissist. Another point mentioned by Kernberg is what I called 20 years prior to Kernberg's article, I called it psychopathological resonance. Kernberg elaborated on this point in 2020, but I was the first to suggest it um, more than 30 years prior to that. I suggested that the pro-social communal narcissist, malignant narcissist, actually resonates with similar pathologies in the in-group. In other words, I suggested that membership in the in-group is not random, but it is based on a principle of mutual selection. The members of the in-group select the malignant narcissist because they themselves in some ways or in many ways have tendencies to be malignant narcissists. They are sadistic, they are psychopathic, they are antisocial, they are narcissistic, they are grandiose. So there is a psychopathological resonance. Psychopathology of the malignant narcissist chosen as a charismatic leader. His facade of pro-sociability and communality, all these resonate with identical or similar psychopathologies in his followers, in his acolytes, in, in his psychophants, in his fans and, and uh, in people who support him, his supporters. And so it's not a random situation. Anyhow, this is the first video I would, I, I've made, I'm making about the prosocial communal narcissist. There'll be more to follow. So I think the prosocial communal malignant narcissist is the biggest threat to the existence of the human species nowadays. It's a big threat. Whether the, the prosocial communal malignant narcissist is involved in gender studies or in um, politics or in show business, wherever the prosocial communal malignant narcissist is involved, there is strife, there is division, there is conflict, and ultimately there is self-destruction. There is a new extensive update to the website and the Android app that contain the transcripts to all my videos on YouTube, all 1,400 of them. The website is vaknin-talks.com. <laughs> Vaknin talks and talks and talks. <laughs> Will this guy ever stop talking? This 
author of malignant self-love narcissism revisited a former visiting professor of psychology and currently on the faculty of siaps poor siaps <laughs> <laughs> okay, Shoshanim Chmad Madot. Look it up. Today we are going to discuss hate bombing. Yes, not love bombing, but hate bombing. The opposite of love bombing. <laughs> the antonym, if you wish. It's a very interesting phenomenon which serves to expose some dynamics of narcissism long um, neglected by self-styled experts online and even by scholars offline. Here's the thing. <clears throat> the borderline has too many emotions. Her emotions are too strong, too powerful for her. Her emotions overwhelm her, drown her, dysregulate her. The, the narcissist has too many cognitions especially distorted cognitions, such as grandiosity. The narcissist's cognitions overwhelm him, drown him, dysregulate him. So remember this equation. Borderline, dysregulated emotions. Narcissist, dysregulated cognitions. Before I proceed, I anticipate your comments. He equals she. Everything I say applies to male and female narcissists the same way. The dynamic is identical. 50% of all narcissists are women nowadays. Quite an accomplishment. Bravo, feminism. <laughs> okay, enough with politics, Vaknin. Get to the point if you are capable of it. So the point is that when your cognition overwhelms you, when you're a cognitive animal, when you have no positive emotions to tap, when you are unable to access positive emotions, then anything can fit into your cognition. You can think about anything. Anything could become a reason for bragging, boasting. The narcissist is proud of things which would make other people cringe or flinch. <laughs> and yet the narcissist finds these things, events in his past, alleged talents, ostensible skills, and so on and so forth. He finds these things reasons for pride. He's proud of them. The, this is known as locus of grandiosity. So the narcissist, for example, can be proud of being the ultimate victim, can be proud of being the most amazing criminal can be proud of having failed consistently or having brought on the biggest bankruptcy in the history of his country. All these are reasons to be proud. All these are loki of grandiosity. <clears throat> the locus of grandiosity is anything, any event, any environment, any person, any place, any accomplishment, any failure, any trait, any behavior, any action, any decision, any choice, any source of supply, anything, absolutely anything that sets the narcissist apart, that renders the narcissist unique and special, at least in his own eyes. So, the locus of grandiosity is the key to deciphering and decoding the narcissist's behavior. And I want today to discuss a very, a very unique locus of grandiosity, very rare, but still there. The vast majority of relationships with narcissists start with a process known as love bombing. Now, love bombing is not grooming. As usual, self-styled experts online confuse the two and make a mess and a hash of things. Grooming is limited to minors and is usually the purvey and behavior of psychopaths and sexual predators, especially sexual sadists. So this is grooming. You cannot groom an adult, <laughs> only a minor, only a child. But love bombing. So most relationships start with love bombing, where you're the focus of attention, where you can do no wrong, where you are being idealized, 
where you are perfection, reify, where you are the most drop dead gorgeous and hyper intelligent person to have walked the earth, etc., etc. This is very flattering and very addictive. This is love bombing. However, sometimes relationships with narcissists start with hate bombing. Hate bombing. The narcissist is full of scorn, of contempt, of derision. The narcissist criticizes you, chastises you, castigates you, humiliates you, berates you, demeans and degrades you. At the very beginning of the relationship, long before there's anything to share, the very first interactions, the first text message, the first chat on a dating app, the first in exchange or intercourse, <laughs> to use a 19th century word, the first exchange on a social media website, the first video, the first photo, the first text message, they are negative. This kind of narcissist puts you down from the first moment. He establishes not only his superiority, but equally your inferiority, your inadequacy. So this narcissist emphasizes, leverages, brainwashes you into believing that you are a bad object, unworthy, possibly ugly, stupid, uh, grandiose and arrogant, a helpless, hopeless, a failure, a loser, and so on and so forth. This is hate bombing, the mirror image of love bombing. And amazingly, hate bombing does lead to relationships with narcissists, does result in the formation of a shared fantasy. This is, of course, when the counterparty, with a potential intimate partner or friend, they are masochistic, self-hating, self-loathing and self-rejecting. The narcissist becomes an externalized introject, a voice that confirms, supports, buttresses, enhances, and magnifies the bad object inside the potential partner or friend or whatever, child, or spouse, and so on. So, we have two types of shared fantasy. The most common type starts with idealization. The less common type, so idealization through love bombing, the less common type starts with evaluation, actually, through hate bombing. Now, these, the, the latter type of shared fantasy, this second type of shared fantasy, which no one seems to discuss, I believe this is the first video ever made about this uh, kind of uh, <laughs> launching of a relationship. So, usually these are malignant, psychopathic, and sometimes sadistic narcissists. The locus of grandiosity of the malignant, psychopathic, and sadistic narcissist is that he is vulner invulnerable. He has no vulnerabilities. He has no weaknesses. He has no chinks in the armor. He cannot be destabilized or hurt. He cannot be affected. He cannot be infected. He is godlike. He is firewalled from the slings and arrows of cruel time and cruel people. He is invulnerable. He is unemotional. So this kind of narcissist brags and boasts about not having emotions. He says, I have no emotions to speak of. Therefore, I'm immune to the vicissitudes, ups and downs and dysregulation of other people. I'm much more resilient and much stronger. I'm empowered by my unemotionality and invulnerability. This kind of narcissists are incapable of attaching. They have flat attachment, not insecure attachment. Insecure attachment implies an attempt to attach, which constantly fails, approach avoidance. This kind of narcissist doesn't even try to approach. He is, again, proud. He is vainglorious. He is proud of his lack of attachment. He says, I never get attached. I never fall in love. I never bond. 
and this is a source of my strength. I am a lone wolf because I'm utterly self-sufficient. I need no one. I care about no one. No one can pull at my heartstrings. No one can blackmail me emotionally. No one can inflict pain on me. No one can compromise me in any way, shape or form. He regards people as a kind of malware, computer viruses, if you wish. So invulnerable, unemotional, unattached, incapable of getting attached or bonded, um, and therefore immune. Immune to the world, immune to life itself, immune to other people, rigid and heartlessly, callously cruel, although sometimes this cruelty or sadism are disguised as altruism when the malignant psychopathic narcissist in question is the, of the prosocial or communal variety. And I encourage you to watch the videos about prosocial, communal, hypermoral narcissists, rigidly moral narcissists. So let's summarize this section. It's not easy to wrap your mind around. Typical narcissists start with love bombing. They idealize you and then they launch a shared fantasy, and then they introduce you, coercively or not, into the shared fantasy. They cajole you, they persuade you, they charm you, they, and they cause you to become a figment or an element in the shared fantasy. This is what 97% of all narcissists do. 3% of narcissists, known as malignant, psychopathic, or sadistic narcissists, they don't start by idealizing you. They don't love bomb, they hate bomb. They start by devaluing you. Exactly the opposite. And they cater to your self-destructiveness, self-rejection, self-hatred, self-loathing, self-defeat. They become the scourge of God. They, they are kind of a punishment inflicted on you by the universe itself. You're spiraling down and they're there to push you over the edge, over the cliff. Forgive me for mixing my metaphors. Now, these types of narcissists are proud. They're grandiose. They're arrogant about, they feel superior because they regard themselves as invulnerable. I don't care about anyone and anything. I don't need anyone or anything. I'm not dependent on anyone or anything. I'm unemotional. I never attach. I am rigid. I'm heartless. When necessary, I'm abrasive and cruel. If this type of narcissist is also pro-social or communal, they transform all these into advantages, into merits. They say, for example, my cruelty is a kind of tough love. I'm being altruistic. It's for your own good and so on. But the fact is that they embark upon a shared fantasy which is destructive to you, sadistic in the sense that they enjoy the pain that they inflict on you, and a shared fantasy that whose main target, whose main goal is to devalue, humiliate, mortify, degrade, demean, and berate you, put you down, essentially. This kind of narcissists are transactional. Now, all narcissists regard other people as useful tools <laughs> in bonds, both senses of the word tool. They regard other people as collateral damage. The narcissist perceives his life and the environment as a battlefield. There's a war going on between the narcissist and the rest of humanity. It's a zero-sum game. The narcissist's win is other people's loss. And so the narcissist needs to ascertain that he has the upper hand. He regards other people as useful instruments or collateral damage in this ongoing warfare. The impact that the narcissist has on other people's lives is perceived by the narcissist as a mere byproduct or side effect of the pursuit of grandiosity-affirming narcissistic supply, sadistic supply, 
or even self supply. Sometimes the narcissist has a beneficial impact on other people's lives. If the narcissist is a healer, a guru, a teacher, they may end up having um, very good effects, benevolent effects, impacts long term on other people's lives. But even this is perceived by the narcissist as a byproduct, a side effect. There's no motivation or intention to help people. The narcissist does everything in order to obtain narcissistic supply, period. When the narcissist is pro-social and communal, because the, it's because these are easier ways, the path of least resistance to obtaining supply. That's it. If he, uh, if he becomes a fixer or a rescuer or a savior or a healer or a guru or a teacher or a mentor, it's just because, because it's the easiest way to garner and harvest narcissistic supply. Narcissistic supply, sadistic supply, or self-supply. These are the only things that have any meaning in the narcissist's life. And people are dispensable, interchangeable, meaningless, insignificant others. This applies to all narcissists. So when you talk to the narcissist, imagine the following dialogue. Do you care about me? Narcissist, I do. I care a lot about you. Why, you ask, why do you care about me? And the narcissist answers, because you are useful to me. I like your company, you help me, you uh, service me, you solve my problems, you hear from me, etc. You're useful to me. And then you ask, okay, but don't you have any emotions for me? When you see me or something, don't you, don't you react emotionally? The narcissist says, proudly, I don't have emotions. I don't do emotions. I do relationship maintenance. I do business. I do give and take. Emotions are for weasels. Emotions are for dumb people. Emotions are weaknesses and vulnerabilities. And I'm godlike. I'm invulnerable. I'm strong. I'm resilient. I'm all powerful, omnipotent. I'm all knowing. So you ask, why do you stay in touch with me? And the narcissist responds, I owe you and I repay, I always repay my debts because I'm much more moral than other people. Plus, you could still be useful in the future. <laughs> so it's a kind of hedge, a kind of insurance policy. These are typical narcissistic, this is a typical narcissistic mindset. This is not unique to any variant of narcissism. Not, it's not that it's only cerebrals, only somatics, only coverts, only overts, or only malignant, or only sadistic. No, they all they all share the same attitude to people. People are objectified, dehumanized, and treated as pawns on the chessboard of the narcissist's life, on his constant striving and craving for narcissistic supply. But there is something unique when it comes to malignant psychopathic and sadistic narcissists. Their world is inverted. Now, the narcissist world is sufficiently distorted to be vertiginous, sufficiently upside down, topsy-turvy, to cause vertigo, <laughs> to, to render you dizzy. Now, imagine that the malignant narcissist or the sadistic narcissist their world is an, is an inversion of the narcissist's distorted and inverted world. Can you go there? Can you even contemplate this? Can you conceive of this? It's really outlandish, out of this world. And so, whereas the typical narcissist regards you as a utility, as useful, in some way, in one way or another, it, you allow him to idealize himself, you, collab you collude with him in the shared fantasy, you provide him with sex, with services, with supply, sadistic or narcissistic, with, with uh, safety, you are there, you're always present, you fulfill a maternal role. This is a typical narcissist. Narcissists react, they're reactive, 
to these offerings, to these gifts that you carry, and they bond with you, they create with you a shared something known as a shared fantasy. It is shared after all. It's a kind of a cult. It's a collusion, a collaboration. It takes two to tango. This is the typical narcissist. And the typical narcissist starts off by convincing himself that he is falling for you, that he's in love with you, or that he has affection for you, or that he somehow understands you, so he resonates with you empathically. He provides you with succor. He is on your side. He has your back, and so on. So the typical narcissist starts off with love bombing, which leads to a fantasy where both of you are united, both of you are symbiotically merged and fused against the world, against all other people. The, the malignant the narcissist, the psychopathic narcissist, the sadistic narcissist, their shared fantasy is totally inverted. It's a mirror image of the typical narcissist's shared fantasy. Malignant, psychopathic, sadistic narcissist starts off, uh, initiate the relationship, with devaluation and discard. <laughs> it's like the shared fantasy is, is reversed in time. It's like time tra travel. The malignant, psychopathic, sadistic narcissist starts by devaluing you, insulting you, humiliating you, shouting at you, attacking you, berating you, demeaning you, heaping scorn on you, holding you in contempt and utter ostentatious disdain, putting you down, and so on and so forth, devaluation, and then discards you. He blocks you on social media, even before you have met, and he does it consistently. So it's as if the shared fantasy is reversed in time. The malignant psychopathic narcissist starts with devaluation and discard. Why is that? Because remember, the malignant psychopathic and sadistic narcissist are goal-oriented. All psychopaths are goal-oriented. And the vast majority of sadists are psychopathic. So there's goal orientation there. What is the goal of the shared fantasy? Do you remember? The goal of the shared fantasy is to reenact early childhood failed separation individuation. The narcissist has failed as a child to separate from the mother, to become an individual, now he needs you to act as a maternal figure from which he can separate successfully and become an individual, grow up, become an adult. So this is the aim of the shared fantasy. This is the end point. This is the goal of the shared fantasy. The psychopathic narcissist sees no reason not to, to go directly to the goal. He doesn't understand why he has to go through a whole convoluted long-winded shared fantasy, if the goal is devaluation, if the goal is separation, and the only way to obtain separation is via devaluation. If he has to devalue the potential intimate partner in order to obtain separation, he says to himself, let me start with the devaluation. Why need to go through phases like love bombing that have nothing to do with the devaluation, nothing to do with the separation? I need to get to the point. I don't have time. I don't want to waste my resources, which are scarce anyhow. I don't want to invest. I don't want to commit. I don't want to affect. I don't want to you know, put an effort into this. I need you to act as my maternal figure because I need to separate from you. And in order to separate from you, I need to devalue you. So I'm going to devalue you now. I've been you from the beginning. I'm not going to go through the other phases, which have nothing to do with separation, nothing to do with individuation, nothing to do with evaluation, nothing to do with, with the aim of the fantasy. I'm goal-oriented. I'm going to realize and actualize the goal of the fantasy to start with. This is the whole point of the fantasy, says the malignant psychopathic narcissist. So I'm going to start by devaluing you and discarding you. It's a form of negative idealization. Uh, mythological demonization, conversion of you into a persecutory object, into an enemy. So the psychopathic malignant narcissist comes across 
a potential intimate partner, a potential friend, a potential spouse, a potential colleague, you know, comes across someone who can collaborate in a shared fantasy or can become a part of the shared fantasy. Whereas the typical narcissist would start to love bond and idealize in order to get to the point of devaluation and separation, the psychopathic malignant narcissist will get, go straight to the point. He will start by devaluing the potential, the potential intimate partner, the potential friend, will start by devaluing. He will start by discarding, pushing that person away. He would act aggressively, abrasively, humiliate, uh, block, <laughs> ban, I mean, go crazy, become sometimes violent. Um, and at the same time, he would devalue the potential partner. He would hate bomb rather than love bomb. Hate bombing is a form of negative idealization. The, the partner, the potential target, is idealized, but is ide she is idealized as a mythological demon. So the malignant psychopathic narcissist when he comes across someone who could fit into a shared fantasy, demonizes her, idealizes her as a mythological malevolent uh, entity. So he exaggerates the evil and wickedness and malice and malevolence of the partner. That's his way of negatively idealizing her. Naturally, the shared fantasies of malignant psychopathic narcissists are extremely short, nasty, and brutal. Um, they could last hours, sometimes days. In rare cases, the malignant psychopathic narcissist meets his match. He comes across someone who he believes could serve as his partner, his collaborator in a shared fantasy. He says to himself, wow, she's the one. I want her in my shared fantasy. I'm going to devalue her right now. I'm going to discard her right now. I'm going to insult her. I'm going to humiliate her. I'm going to shout at her. I'm going to verbally abuse her. I'm going to treat her coercively. I'm going to, you know, I'm going to do all these things to her because she's perfect. She's the one I want to separate from. She is a perfect bad mother, perfect maternal figure. She's demonic. She's mythologically demonic. She's ideal. No one has been more demonic than her ever. So he says to himself, I must have, have her. If anyone is worth separating for, from, she is the one. And I need to incorporate her in the shared fantasy now, because I can incorporate her now. And in two hours, I can separate from her devalue her, discard her, render her an enemy, a persecutory object, and I'm on my way to becoming an individual, to individuate. I skip all the stages of love bombing and this and that. I skip all this nonsensical, uh, mushy, tree-hugging mess. I don't need any of this. I'm tough, I'm resilient, I'm rough, I'm strong, I'm empowered, I'm untouchable, I'm immune, I am the malignant psychopathic narcissist so I can get I can go straight to the point avoiding and skipping all the interim stages which are for more supple and compliant and submissive narcissists malignant psychopathic narcissist looks down at typical narcissists he considers them weak too weak for his own taste actually malignant psychopathic narcissists take advantage of typical narcissists they abuse them uh, they regard typical narcissists as delusional and gullible, which they are. So sometimes the malignant psychopathic narcissist comes across this perfect, perfect partner in the shared fantasy. She is everything the malignant psychopathic narcissist is, has ever looked for in a partner from which he can separate by devaluing. But on rare occasions, there's a misjudgment. Whereas psychopathic malignant narcissists 
are likely to be attracted to submissive, pliant, malleable, weak, damaged, and broken women or partners. Again, men, women, women, men, it's all interchangeable. The genders are interchangeable. So whereas male psychopathic malignant narcissists are likely to be attracted to this type of partner, as I said, weak, malleable, pliant, submissive, and so on and so forth, sometimes they misjudge. They don't realize that behind the facade of submissiveness, compliance, uh, obedience, weakness, femininity or masculinity, and so behind this facade, there is actually a dangerous predator. In rare cases, where the potential partner is misidentified and is actually another malignant or sadistic narcissist, they have met their match. And there's a battle of wills which evolves. The, the original sadistic, malignant, psychopathic narcissist tries to devalue and discard the other psychopathic malignant narcissist. And so you have two psychopathic sadistic malignant narcissists in, in a joint battle, They're fighting each other. They're at war, like, you know, Godzilla and uh, King Kong. They're at war. And the amazing thing is, one of them is going to give in. One of them is going to become codependent or even borderline. One of them is going to become dysregulated. One of them is going to become submissive, like in nature, you know. One of them is going to submit. One animal submits to the other visibly, prostrates it, itself. So when you, you have two malignant psychopathic sadistic narcissists who misidentified each other, and now are trying to devalue each other in order to reach the conclusion of the shared fantasy, you have a god-awful mess. You have an enormous explosion of externalized aggression, acting out and crazy making and insanity. One of them surrenders. That's inevitable in such a situation. And one of them becomes dysregulated and cognitively dysregulated and essentially uh, codependent and with borderline behaviors, borderline personality organization. And they manifest uh, dysregulated abuse and coercive behaviors toward, you, toward each other. So you see the, the two, in the initial phase, you see the two psychopathic malignant narcissists cycling very fast. It's a kind of ritualized approach avoidance, but they cycle very fast between aggressive and submissive, violent and withdrawing, avoidant and approaching, um, in your face and demurring, coercive and obedient. They cycle, both of them cycle very rapidly in, uh, in, uh, among, uh, along, among these behaviors. And it's an amazing sight to behold because it's like it's a kaleidoscope but it's like shape-shifting it's as if um, there's a total dysregulation of the self-state system and multiple self-states a dozen self-states are trying to compete for the same physical body from the same for the same space and you can see everything shifting sometimes within minutes when each one of the two malignant, sadistic, psychopathic narcissists is trying to subdue the other, is trying to convert the other into a typical partner in a shared fantasy, a partner which can be then devalued, who can be then devalued and discarded and allow for separation, individuation. This attempt, this clash between these two dinosaurs, T-Rex and Brontosaurus, or I don't know what, this is earth shattering, earth quaking. It's, it's an amazing sight to behold. Um, in the inverted fantasy, inverted shared fantasy of the psychopathic malignant narcissist, um, typically 
following the devaluation and the discard, the malignant psychopathic etc. would just go no contact with the with the target, with the victim. Because mission accomplished. Separation has been accomplished and the target has been devalued and discarded and the narcissist, who is essentially a psychopath, can move on to the next target, to the next goal. So, in a typical case, there will be total withdrawal, total avoidance, no contact, and the narcissist, the psychopathic, malignant, sadistic narcissist would simply vanish, disappear. Unlike typical narcissists, psychopathic, malignant, sadistic narcissists rarely hoover, actually. They rarely hoover because they have never gone through the snapshotting idealization phase. They went immediately to the evaluation and discard. They didn't have time to create a representation of the shared fantasy inside their minds. So while they do have internal objects, these internal objects are not idealized. They are per secretary. And these internal objects are very rudimentary, very primitive, because there hasn't been enough time to idealize them and evolve them. They don't have a life story. And so these objects, these internal objects, are not energetic. They're not imbued with energy. They, are not, they don't create dissonance. They don't create anxiety. So the sadistic, psychopathic, malignant narcissist doesn't have a need to hover, except in extremely rare cases. But when the sadistic, psychopathic narcissist, the malignant narcissist, comes across another malignant narcissist, and when they compete for ownership of the shared fantasy, who will devalue whom? Who will be in charge? Who will control whom? Who will abuse whom? When this battle of the giants goes on, finally, one of them transitions to the role of a victim, letting the other one initiate the separation by betraying them. And this is the famous betrayal fantasy. So, four scenarios with the shared fantasy. A typical narcissist, love bombs, love bombs, idealizes you, devalues you, and discards you in order to separate from you and individuate, and Typically, this kind of narcissist would hoover you unless you have mortified him. The second type of shared fantasy is a malignant narcissist who, from the, ver from the get go, from the first moment, devalues you and discards you because this is the goal of the shared fantasy and they are goal oriented. Having devalued and discarded you, this kind of narcissist obtains separation, and because he doesn't have a developed internal object representing you in his mind, he doesn't need to hover you. That's the second type of shared fantasy. The third type of shared fantasy is two malignant narcissists, one of them having misidentified the other. And now they're in battle over control, over dominance and submission, over devaluation and idealization, over, over everything. The shared fantasy is intact, but it incorporates extreme elements of abuse, coercion, and aggression, sometimes devolving to violence. And the fourth type of a shared fantasy is when one malignant narcissist becomes dominant and the other one becomes submissive. In this particular case, the submissive malignant narcissist would claim the role of a victim and would, in, would perceive himself as having been betrayed. And this is the betrayal fantasy. I have videos dedicated to the betrayal fantasy on this channel. Now you can search the channel either by using keywords, but much, much more easily you could visit the playlists on this channel. They are thematic playlists. And you can choose the theme. You could just scroll through the playlist and find the video that answers your question. So hate bombing and the role of the malignant narcissist they are much neglected in literature since the 1970s, and they are literally nowhere to be found online among self-styled experts. The shared fantasy of the malignant narcissist is a mirror image 
an inverted image of the shared fantasy of a typical Nazi. It starts with devaluation, not with idealization. It aims to discard you long before you have become the narcissist partner. It is goal-oriented and it is about power. The psychopaths are about power. It's about it's a power play. With the role of narcissistic supply serving as a kind of signaling, power signaling. The more narcissistic supply I have, the more powerful I am. It's about power because this kind of narcissist feels proud of having power. The locus of the grandiosity of this kind of narcissist is in the power that this kind of narcissist possesses in his own mind at least. He regards himself as invulnerable, untouchable, immune to the consequences of his actions, unemotional, uh, unattached, rigid, heartless, sometimes moral, and definitely abrasive and cruel, resilient. So, the shared fantasy of the malignant narcissist would reflect these preferences in grandiosity, the specific cognitive distortions of this particular type of narcissist. It's a psychopath, so it's goal-oriented, it's sadist, so pain has a role here, a positive role, and it's a narcissist, so there's a need for separation and the shared fantasy. And you thought narcissism is nothing but arrogance of an a-hole. <laughs> it is, but there's a lot more to it than this. So, I've enjoyed my voice and your silence. Stick around for the next episode of the Samvaknin Horror Show.